HHVM, which stands for Hip Hop VM, plus Angular JS, and some other things you can only do with Platform SH. So um, in case you want to still run away and get out of this session if it's the wrong thing for you, uh, we're going to use uh, an example application using those technologies to show um, some of the interesting workflow challenges and development challenges that you might run into as a team and some of the ways that uh, the product that uh, Augustone and I work on helps solve that. So it's very product oriented. This is one of the sponsor um, uh, sessions, so we get to talk about our product. <laughs> so if you don't want to hear about our product, get out of here, and that's fine. No offense taken if you want to hear uh, something uh, less product oriented. I just wanted to get that out there up front. Um, also, if you um, were worried about the word headless and the fact that I brought a French guy with me, don't be worried. We're not going to be doing any physical decoupling today. So, who's this guy standing next to me over here? His name's Augustin de Laporte, and he is uh, in the platform team. He is in charge of software delivery. Um, literally, not a single byte of code goes deployed without his intense scrutiny. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you know Robert Douglas, right? Uh, so, he's been in the Drupal community for years, and he's now the um, director of support and director of operations in, uh, in the Platform SH team. Uh, great guy. If you don't know him, you should really go talk to him because Thanks, he's obviously. actually a great guy. Um, you want to talk about Commerce Guys? You talk about Commerce Guys. Okay, so um, maybe you don't know the story. Uh, Commerce Guys is behind Platform SH. Platform SH, that's the solution we're going to talk about today. Uh, Commerce Guys is the creator of uh, Drupal Commerce and uh, the distribution behind that also Commerce Kickstart. And uh, we're now working on uh, Commerce uh, 2.x, which is the next generation for its Commerce for Drupal 8 and for any PHP-based application. Um, and um, yeah, basically, Commerce guys started to work on a project called Platform SH as an R&D project at the beginning. And it grows, it grows, it grows, and then the team, um, yeah. Basically well, what we wanted initially was to build an ideal hosting environment and development <laughs> workflow for working with Drupal Commerce. When we got done with it, we realized what we'd built was an ideal hosting environment and work development workflow for basically any PHP application. So about a year ago, we took that to market under the uh, product name Platform SH, which we're going to show you. And in the meantime, we've also realized that the, um, the generic benefits that you get from our product are also extensible to other application uh, domains. So um, we have in the final stages of testing uh, this week Python and Node.js support as well. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the product, um, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more in the focused context of Drupal 8, um, but it's good to keep in mind that it's a general platform as a service for any PHP application now. And in the very near future, it'll be a general platform as a service for Node.js and Python as well. Yeah. And uh, we started as implementing all the services that you might need for Drupal, and then we extended that with more services that um, other PHP-based framework might need. So since it's a sponsored application, a uh, sponsor session, we're going to go and give you a small tour of the, the kind of the key features of the product. Uh, so Robert. this video um, is just to set the base. Like when we talk about platform, what are we talking about? Because the rest comes in the context of this. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the key things that we offer for a development team is that for every Git branch, you get an entire copy of your application with all of the data. And you get that in about two minutes time. Um, so all you have to do is Git branch your application. And then in two minutes, you've got a new URL, a new environment uh, to test on. We kind of kill dev stage prod, okay, that no longer exists because that's actually a limitation. What you want is for every feature branch in your story or every story branch and feature branch in your sprint, a way to test your application. And we, we provide that. One of the hard things about providing that, if you were to do it yourself, is the data synchronization. If you have 10 gigabytes of data, MySQL export, MySQL import, Go get lunch, come back, hope it's done. With us, you've got that in two minutes uh, in between the environments. And it's, it's quite fast and quite easy to do. Um, it makes the branching and merging of your development workflow at the infrastructure level as cheap as branching and merging at the Git level. 
And we've got specific starting points for applications like Drupal, Symfony, Magento, WordPress that get you going um, up and up and running quickly with those stacks. So, for example, with Drupal, it makes sure Drush is available as a dependency, knows how to handle your settings PHP file, provides the right private, public, um, uh, temporary mount points, etc. And it's not just for the typical MySQL Solar. Uh, Varnish Redis stack. If you want a RabbitMQ as a you know uh, message queue, or if you want to use Elasticsearch, or maybe your database is Postgres, we support those and a lot more services. Yeah, and what, what you can also get is that we don't uh, bypass your development workflow if you're using Bitbucket or if you're using uh, GitLab or GitHub. Uh, platform will just integrate nicely within their UI. So we have add-on for GitHub, the add-on for Bitbucket, and you see for each pull request that you might. Uh, push or each branch that you want to, uh, to test on, you have a specific environment that is deployed on platform automatically. So you just, put your co you just push your code to GitHub or to any uh, Git management uh, hosting solution you're using, and it's going to deploy. And we're hosting the Symfony documentation like that, so every pull request that is pushed to Symfony doc documentation is actually automatically built uh, on platform SA. So every developer can just push his code, test there, and review uh, what's actually been built. And, uh, and we support something also, which is that you can push multiple applications inside the same Git repository. So basically, you can push your Drupal as a backend, uh, and our, as we're going to see, and uh, Angular as a front end for your application. You push that into one repository, and platform will be able to build all of those at once. Uh, and you can try it for free. Uh, so we're, yeah, you can see, see us at the boost later. Uh, but that was for the basis of the, of the, of the solution, right? Um, so now... We want to, so let's yeah. introduce this pro the problem space that we want to talk about. Um, and specifically, uh, I want to make clear, uh, first of all, what the headless Drupal 8 and the Angular JS and Hip Hop VM, I just want to lay all those out for everybody. It's kind of out of order from the slides, but I think it's important. So what we're going to show you is a Drupal 8 application. Um, it's a movie database, and we're actually um, <coughs> We're actually taking this from a, an example that we got from DrupalCon LA. Uh, so I think we can uh, we, we can just go go there and show that to yeah yeah it feels like the right time to talk about it yeah so we got this from Travis Tidwell from the DrupalCon LA is he in the room Travis you Travis here? you're here no call out to the man who made yeah. the application yeah. Um, so we didn't do anything new with this application because it's a great prototype already for the general pattern, and that is to use Drupal as a data store and an API provider. And what it is is it's a movie database, and uh, however you get the movies in there, you, you can use the Drupal front end or you could import them somehow. The idea is that then Drupal is going to provide an API to applications or other clients who want to use that data to build an application based on movie data. And what Augustan's showing here is um, some JSON output. Is that JSON? Yeah. A JSON output um, from an API call to list the movies or a specific movie. So the idea is that Drupal no longer is providing the front-end application for the, the, the actual end user. It's providing the back-end management system for the database and the APIs for the front-end, which then becomes the AngularJS application. So with AngularJS or any of the other, um, you probably all saw Dries' keynote yesterday where he talked about this a lot, you can uh, make really rich front-end experiences, and all you have to do is call out for the data to the right API that you need, and it uses that, and it provides a real-time experience. Um, if you add a movie to the database, it'll appear in your list like magic. Um, yeah. And we're going to show a bit of that. So that's, that's the Drupal site. That's the Symfony no. application. Oh, that's the that's the Angular application. The Angular, sorry. Um, and I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if you've tried to uh, actually build an API with Drupal 8, but it's really super easy, right? So you have your content type, and you can expose that as a RESTful API. So you don't have anything to do. Uh, there is a RESTful module uh, for that to work on platform. We just have. Uh, I just had enabled the course module so that I can do cross origin uh, request because uh, if you look at the two URLs here, we have a master dash project ID uh, US platform SH, and then you have uh, a different URL which is Drupal dash 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 uh, master. Uh, so it's the same branch, but it's two different applications with two different URLs. So if they need to communicate together, I need to uh, enable the course uh, module, and that application is very easy. Uh, there is a video, so again from Travis. Uh, from DrupalCon uh, LA, um, 
And really, you should watch that video. It, it, it really explains all the concept between those two, um, those, um, yeah, that way of working with, uh, with Drupal 8 and uh, Angular. Uh, and it's like complete decoupling. So Dries yesterday talked about uh, different uh, decoupling, the, the progressive decoupling and uh, the complete decoupling, and that's the complete decoupling. All right. Uh, then and finally, uh, in our yeah, the source code. code. Yeah, the source code is available on GitHub. So uh, if you just want to check the, the URL, you can just uh, fork that repo and push that to platform if you want to try, and you're going to have a headless Drupal working on, uh, on platform with Drupal 8 and Angular. And you see that I only have like two folders, one for the Angular application, one for the Drupal application, and um, some images just for the readme and the platform, uh, the dot .platform folder, which is specific for platform SH, which is going to list all the services that uh, you actually might uh, want to use. Thank you, great. So now you know what the application does. And, the, and the, we'll talk about the hip hop VM part a little bit later. All right. um, I wanted to make sure we understood what the application does before we talk about the problem space <laughs> that we want to solve. So we've got, we want to do that type of application development. What problems are we going to run into? Okay, we, we identified three categories of problems that we're gonna run into and we want to show how we can solve those problems. So um, the first, and this is a general DevOps problem. This isn't specific to the application that we're showing you, but it's, it's relevant enough to talk about in any case. And that is pushing um, and managing non-code changes to a runtime environment. And this can be all sorts of stuff. So this could be like the PHP versions that you're using. Obviously, we're talking about Hip Hop VM. So if you're not using Hip Hop VM and you want to change to it, you have to change your PHP runtime. That's a non-code change to a runtime environment. Another type of change would be adding new PHP extensions, adding, you know, changing PHP I and I. I'm very focused on PHP here, but this could extend to any aspect of your stack configuration. Or going a step higher, adding whole new services, such as, you know, maybe you'd want to try out that elastic search that we mentioned. Maybe you do have a message queue. Um, message queues become particularly relevant when you're working between multiple applications because a lot of times you have uh, asynchronous requests that need to go between them or data that needs to be moved between them and that needs to be coordinated and a message queue is a perfect solution for those. So having that available to your application is a great uh, advantage in those cases. And since we're already showing an example of an application, the Angular application that takes uh, JSON inputs as its um, primary input, that's the Angular app, then a lot of people will be interested in using uh, PostgreSQL because PostgreSQL is doing just a great job these days of providing um, a JavaScript native um, document-oriented um, data store similar to what you'd expect from a MongoDB, which then makes PostgreSQL an ideal solution for building an Angular front-end application based on data stored in the PostgreSQL. So maybe you want that. These are all changes to a runtime environment that you might make, and how do you coordinate that across an entire development team? So and, and, and you don't want those changes only to happen on your production server. You want those changes to also apply on your devs, dev environments, your sprints environment, any test environment that you might have, uh, because you want that to be coherent with what you're going to actually deploy on your production site, right? So you don't want to have to manage those changes on each of them. You just want to change them at one place and so they get deployed everywhere. That's the problem that uh, people are facing. The next problem that we identified is simply the, the human workflow aspect of coordinating multiple sub-teams in a project. So we're presenting an application to you where there are at least three roles that you might run into. Um, in a true, typical Drupal project, you've got this division between Drupal coder and Drupal themer, as made famous by the epic uh, battles between the Drupal coder and Drupal themer at many Drupal cons. That, um, unfortunately, not this one, but they've got a running session where they try to solve the same problem from the coder point of view and from the themer point of view. So the, those are two roles, but those are within one project. That's already difficult enough to coordinate between coders and themers inside of Drupal. But when you add a complete new domain of uh, expertise to this, the Angular application, and this person might know nothing about Drupal whatsoever, then it becomes a little bit more challenging to coordinate your team's workflow and the deployment workflow and the sprint plannings, et cetera, et cetera. So some of the goals that you have there are to achieve independence amongst the teams so that you never have a case where one team is blocking the other or where you have to have an overly uh, 
expensive amount of communication between the teams about what are you doing today? What are you doing today? Okay, then let's, you know, you don't really want that. In an ideal case in an application like this, you'd specify an API and the Angular team would go to town and the Drupal team would uh, fulfill the API um, and whatever needs they were doing, like the, the role of the data entry. But deploying this to testing environments, staging environments, making sure the stakeholders can see it, uh, making sure the project managers can sign off on it, can be a very complicated process because you're literally deploying two separate applications from two different teams, but they have to be in lockstep with each other. How do you version control that, right? If the Angular, Angular team has their own Git repository and the Drupal team their own Git repository, how do you match the version they want tested with the version they want tested, and how do you switch between them really easily? And Platform solves some of these problems. Um, then the third problem that we identified is to rip, replicate complex build processes across various areas of expertise. We've very strongly moved to a time in web application development when you write code that builds code. You don't write the code that you run in the application. You write code that builds the code that you run in the application. So what do I mean by that? Let's start with a Drupal example. With Drupal, we often use things like Drush Make to build a Drupal site, which is, in essence, writing some code that will build a Drupal site. You might write some custom modules. Uh, you might store those in GitHub. You might pull them in during Drush Make or you get submodules. Somehow, you're going to piece together a bunch of code, some of it public, some of it private, some of it specific to that project, some of it maybe specific to your agency, and that's going to become your Drupal site. And this is a common pattern for actually all web applications. If you're doing a Symfony application, uh, you're going to use Composer JSON to do the same thing. If you're doing uh, Node.js, you're going to use NPM. Um, maybe you're going to use Bower. You know, and then we've got PIP. We've got Ruby Gems, and orchestrating all of this build process is now becoming an interesting task. Um, furthermore, when you deploy a Drupal application, you might have subsequent dependencies on things like Ruby, just so you can compile SAS. And you also have a dependency on the developer know-how on how to do that. So um, what are you using, Yeoman, locally? Yeah. So he's using Yeoman so that every change that he makes to his uh, HTML files that he's using for the slides um, automatically recompile the CSS and everything. Yeah, this is Grunt. Grunt. Oh, that's Grunt doing that? Yeah. Okay, so I don't do this stuff. But it's, it's pretty <laughs> I just talk about it. Um, but this is a developer level know-how that then becomes hard to replicate. So um, I recently did a, a very small Drupal 8 site where the person I hired to do the theming compiled all the SAS. That meant I couldn't easily go in and change the CSS anymore without also knowing how to compile the SAS, which I didn't at the time, which became a blocking issue for me. I couldn't apply my know-how to the site. I was dependent on him. How do you overcome that? And platform can address that. And this becomes more complicated when you've got more than one application going on because then the areas of domain expertise are so separate that you can't possibly just cross over. Like he could teach me how to compile SAS for that one case, but if I needed to go and modify the Angular JS app, I'd be completely lost. So I might not be able to even deploy it if I don't have all that domain know-how. Yeah. And by, by complex build processes, we also mean, uh, like Rob talked about uh, Makefile for, for Drupal. But uh, if you push your um, composer.json or package.json, you don't want to push all your uh, vendor uh, folder that you have locally because the version might change and you want to rebuild that all the time to make sure that the versions still uh, are current with what you have. So uh, you want to keep your re Git repository as small as possible and listing only the dependencies that you actually want to use with their versions. Uh, so uh, composer.log file, for example, you don't want to push all of the dependencies that you have on your site, right? And that's, that's what we call complex build processes. You want to have everything downloaded when you build your actual environment. And once you've got that process, you want every member of your team to be able to execute it perfectly without having to know every yeah. step of the way. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so let's talk about HHVM a bit now. Well, um, we introduced this before, but I think there are a couple details that now that we've gone through the problem space, we could actually highlight. Um, do you... Yeah, no, let's go on a bit. H, you're right, Hip Hop VM. So uh, the other buzzword in our uh, session title was Hip Hop VM. For those of you who might not know about it, Hip Hop VM was originally released by Facebook as a PHP virtual machine 
that uh, greatly uh, accelerated the runtime execution of PHP so significantly that that's one of the key ingredients about how um, Facebook has achieved scale, uh, the scale that they do. And um, we are happy to announce today that a uh, platform is capable of running your PHP projects in HipHop VM as well. Um, why would you want that? The, the chart that you're looking at is the um, comparison between um, PHP 5, PHP 7, which is the unrele un, you know, up-and-coming version that is not ready for production yet but is showing a lot of promise. And then the yellow bars are uh, HipHop VM. And in this chart, bigger bars is better. Um, and you can see that for different applications, Drupal 7, Drupal 8, Drupal 8 Cache, MediaWiki, and WordPress, in every case, HipHop VM significantly outperforms the others, meaning you can run more sites with more users on less infrastructure, saving everybody money, and giving your, uh, your customers and visitors a better experience. That, that's why you would want it. So you, should, you should really read that blog post. It's really complete, and it's really, um, it's really interesting, uh, because that chart just by itself doesn't... Uh, I mean, right. One of the, the yellow is yellow is good, but one of, one of the um, things that you see in this chart is that the hip hop VM team for the last year at least has been testing explicitly all of these applications and more to make sure that they completely satisfy with no problems the compatibility um, requirements for say Drupal to run in, in, inside of it, and the, they've now achieved 100% compatibility for that, which is why we felt confident deploying it. Yeah, we haven't talked about that yet. Uh, we haven't publish, publicly announced with the blog post. What we haven't, no. we we haven't actually so, publicly announced that. No, you're the you guys are the first one to hear about Hip Hop VM on platform. <laughs> no, we haven't. But I thought we had a blog post. Uh, it should be ready. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I was going to tell them to go read the blog post. Christian, Christian, do it. Okay, so Christian is the guy that wrote the blog post. Uh, let's deploy that right now, right? That's, yeah. uh, that's Are actually you sure a good it's ready? feature. Did somebody proofread it? <laughs> that's a, that's good feature. Good feature to show because it's actually. I can't you'll believe see. my team is going to live deploy in front of you all. <laughs> it, it's a blog post, so it's a live deployment of a blog post. But if I got internet and it, it yeah. So you're going to actually see a live deployment. Uh, that's basically my job. I click on the merge button and it gets deployed. So that's. Oh yeah, this like, is the part where he scrutinizes every byte that gets deployed. Yeah, we now have you one. can see it in action. <laughs> okay, it's called draft. <laughs> So he's on uh, GitHub right now? So, um, yeah. So you see Christian pushed to that branch and Patrick. Oh, Patrick, you reviewed that. Awesome. That's uh, even better. So you see here I got a details button, and uh, I can access that, uh, that URL and see actually the, the website. So it's a hosting platform. It's an, the ID of the pull request. Let's go to the update and check that. HHVM, yeah, cool. So simply by virtue of having a pull request, there was already a built environment to test that change. Okay, it looks good to me. Yeah, let's merge that. Did I mention reviewing every byte? <laughs> <laughs> so if you go to the platform SH blog posts, you'll actually see that it's not there. Uh, I, I want to, yeah, you see it's not there. Uh, let's merge that. I trust you on that, Christian, right? Uh, it's a um, Jekyll-based we Jekyll website, so it's a static uh, website, but we can still build that with platform. But this process would have applied to any, yeah. any stack. Merging. Okay, so now it's actually building my... Uh, I, I could go to the platform UI. How long does it take? Uh, it takes uh, one minute. It needs to download the, the different uh, libraries. Let's go to the platform SH project. It, it wasn't part of the... But it's a cool thing to show. Yeah, It's a good, good feature. Improvising um, on stage. <laughs> So we, you'll see that actually the, the, the master environment, the production environment, is getting, it's getting rebuilt. So not, not on that one. I'm just loading the other project, but the internet is like not, not wanting to, to help there me there. Okay, so I can explain this because it's quite interesting. So when you push to Git on Platform SH, that triggers the entire build and deploy process. Okay, the, the entire release mechanism on Platform SH is Git push. And when you push to Git, Platform does several things. First of all, it looks to see uh, what services you have, and that's in the YAML file. And this could be, um, this, yeah, this will careful. be like PHP, MySQL, Postgres, uh, MongoDB, uh, Elasticsearch, um, Solar, Redis, um, 
RabbitMQ, can, can someone Riemann, um, Zookeeper. Load the page to check that it's there. Just someone can Kafka. load the page because <laughs> I'm caching, so it's there. So, <laughs> so you, you Live deployment. So you can choose um, any of those services, and you put that in a YAML file, and Platform finds that. And then it looks for the relationships between those services, yeah, and it makes an ordered graph of dependencies between them because not all of the services are serving the same applications. And then it looks for the applications that you have, and in the example that we're showing here, there are two applications. There's the AngularJS application and the Drupal application, but you could have more applications. Um, I, if we had had more time and I wasn't so busy being a bull yesterday, then um, we would have had a BHAT application that would have tested both of them concurrently yeah. as a separate development stream, but in the same Git repository. And once it finds the applications, it finds out from previous Git hashes um, and uh, build processes which ones it's already built and which ones haven't changed and which ones are changed, and it won't touch the ones that haven't changed. So the ones that have changed, then it will look through the dependencies, it will install the dependencies, it will look for the scripts that you've put in your build and deploy process, um, and it will start building that. And it will build that um, and package it into a read-only code slug, uh, which is essentially a squash FS um, read-only thing that we then will transport to your application and mount it. And at that point, we, at the edge, freeze incoming requests for that application, meaning we store them in memory as they're incoming, and we turn off all of the services that are in that ordered graph of dependencies. We replace the code slug and the services because the code might have changed the services that you need, like you might have introduced RabbitMQ, in which case we've got all of those services up and running on that code slug. Um, and then as soon as all of the dependencies have reported back that they're fulfilled, then we unfreeze the requests coming in at the edge and they get replayed into that running application as if their internet were just really slow. <laughs> so the requests don't get lost, but your users might wait 30 seconds for it to return, which is, in fact, better than putting your site in maintenance mode. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so here you see all the branches that we've pushed, and automatically, that's what I was uh, showing, uh, when you merge a pull request, you don't need the environment of the pull request anymore, so platform deletes it automatically, and the URL just doesn't work. So you don't consume resources that, you, I mean, you don't need to do to go to the website and say, I don't need this environment, I want to delete it. It's going to be taken care of automatically. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. Uh, let's go back to the, to the solutions. Cause we okay, we give a hand for my deployment manager for spontaneously <laughs> deploying live. <Cool. laughs> All right, so we, pretend, we presented the problem space. Now let's go through the solutions that we have for those. Um, when you want to, the solution to managing non-code changes to a runtime environment, we've, we've kind of pieced that together already. All of the, the non-code changes to your runtime environment that you manage on platform.sh are actually in code. They're in the YAML files that are the metadata for your project. So, for example, if you want to change from PHP 5.5 or 5.6 to Hip Hop VM on platform, you simply update your YAML file as shown, and you get push that, and then that process that I described takes place. It's that easy. Um, if you want to have different PHP extensions, for example, if you want to do some prof profiling and you want to take advantage of the uh, Sensio Labs Blackfire product, product, Blackfire is a profiler for PHP. It's really incredibly good, but you need a PHP extension for it. Um, so you would add that to the list of extensions that you need to the runtime. That's and not actually a PHP extension. That's a platform extension. The, which one? The Blackfire. Uh, Blackfire is a PHP extension. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's the agent, actually. Uh, and those configuration lives in your code base. So once you push that to a branch, it gets deployed, and then when you merge that, it automatically get, takes the same, exactly the same configuration, so you don't need to care about configuring the, the production server. Or Meaning your developers can, at the branch level, experiment exactly. with the infrastructure changes that are needed for their feature and test it there on that branch. Yeah. And then when you merge that into the sprint, then you can test it against all of the other developers' changes for that sprint. And then you merge it into QA or staging or however you named your branches. And by the time you actually deploy this non-code infrastructure change, you've probably done it 20 times. You know exactly how it's going to work because you also, as I mentioned, have the guarantee that the, the, the code and environment that's built will be exactly the same for that code every time as long as the code hasn't changed. So your deployment is extremely predictable. 
and the excuse like it worked on my machine won't, won't appear here. Uh, it just it worked happen. in dev. It worked in my machine and doesn't work on prod. That, that cannot happen. Uh, so and that's this, the same is, this, for, this is the services YAML file I was mentioning where you can list the um, services that you want running. If your developer wanted to use a RabbitMQ, getting that into their project is those, um, those three lines. You name it, that's the first key. Then you just say what type it is and how much persistent storage it needs on the hard drive. And for some services, you can also add uh, some key and values. For example, for Solar, you, you can have your custom uh, XML uh, configuration scheme for Solar, so you'd add the configuration right, right so here. if you need Cyrillic characters or multi-language support or if you want to do n-gram um, you do that right here. Uh, indexing, then you can, you can actually do that. We don't limit what you do on the platform. Yeah. So that was the first... That was the first problem. solution. Yeah. So the second problem um, was coordinating multiple subteams in a project. Um, so what I've got here, I hope that's legible. Um, this is the screen on platform that you use when you add a developer to your project. And the hierarchy that you see there, um, it's really small. Is it possible to plus, plus, plus that? Yeah, must be running. No, that doesn't work. What? Um, it's master, staging, testing, and then I've got AJS Sprint 17, and then RM numbers, and these are uh, mythical branches in a, a sprint for the Angular team that's being managed on Redmine. So that we, uh, I'm just showing how it will look here. Right, exactly. There, this is a, essentially a hierarchy of branches, okay? And then if you go back to the, if you go back to yeah. the screenshot, Augustine, the, the blue bit down there would be the Drupal application. So that's DR Sprint 5 with Jira tickets. So uh, in the example, they're using different project management systems. And what we're sh showing is that the Drupal team works there in their own sprint, and they've got their own hierarchy in the branches where they could create new environments, merge new environments, do everything they want because they've got the user permissions to do so on that set of environments. Uh, and the Angular team has their own tree, and they can do their own sprint workflow however they want. They're completely independent in terms of their internal workflow. They can use Git flow. They can do whatever they need. It can be Agile. It can be Waterfall. Who cares? But at the point where they meet on the testing branch, um, no, the testing branch, um, they'd both be able to merge their stuff there and test it. But when it goes from testing to staging, the way they've got the permissions set up um, in this mythical example, <laughs> would be that at the, for the testing branch to merge into the staging branch, there has to be a release manager. So you have a built-in set uh, governance model where your teams can independently operate um, to a certain extent, but it's like making a pull request beyond that, and somebody else has to review and merge it. And that's really nice because um, we saw in the agencies that we worked with as commerce guys, we met a lot of development and deployment agent, or delivery agencies. Um, some of the bigger ones, um, like Capgemini, expressed to us that they had a very often recurring problem where they um, described a project and won a project at the customer level, and then they needed to resource that project, to which they would turn to outsource teams a development team in India, maybe somebody in Lithuania, and maybe their home team and their home base, uh, and maybe the customer had a team as well, maybe as many four or five development teams on any project. And onboarding these development teams to have exact copies of the application to develop on, but making sure that they didn't step on each other's toes was a real serious problem for them. Yet, this solves it with one uh, form control. When you add the developer, you simply put them in the right team uh, area and then they've got all the control they need to go to town. They can make as many branches and as many copies of, for development or testing as they want and there's a governance when they would go to merge. And it's a feature that is very uh, specific to platform because on Git, if you invite someone to the Git project, he's going to have access to all the branches, no matter what, right? You cannot uh, define per branch the, the, the permissions. So with platform, we have implemented that uh, fine-tuned permission system where you can actually per branch give access to someone. So is not going to mess up with your staging or your master uh, branch, basically. So the third problem that we defined was replicating complex build processes across various areas of expertise. And then we kind of touched on that already in our examples. So um, it's a video I went cold fit here. Oh, yeah. you got a video, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not, uh, we like movies. Yeah. It's not live. I could have done that live, too. So You've here I'm done just enough uh, live already. Thank yeah. you. So here I'm just changing a PHP version on the configuration file for the Angular application. This is the configuration file that I have. 
Um, and uh, for the Drupal application also, I'm upgrading to PHP 5.6. Uh, and then I'm going to push those um, those configuration files, and platform will just rebuild the two applications uh, at the same time. So I'm adding that to my repo and pushing. It's a bit slow. Can you can you read? Yeah, a bit. <laughs> um, so I push, and when I push to platform, I don't only see the logs of my Git. I also see all the deployment process that is happening on the platform side. Okay, so here you see that, uh, uh, like, that's exactly what's happening. So on my Angular application, I'm just uh, downloading some uh, dependencies like uh, Compass for Ruby, uh, Grunt, Bower, and I'm just running npm install, Bower install, Grunt build. So every time I push, platform is going to read my files, my, uh, my dependencies, and download them for my Angular app. So it takes uh, maybe 30 seconds to a minute, uh, depending on... Uh, how the many application is still running at this point. This yeah, is in the background. You don't lose, you don't lose the application. And then once, once the, the Angular application is done building, I'm now building the Drupal application again with PHP 5.6. And for, uh, for the Drupal application, it's actually not uh, the same dependency. I'm just needed Drush, and I'm running a Composer Drupal install. Uh, and at the end, I'm running the update database and feature revert. Uh, so I'm applying all the updates and features uh, that I have on my code base. So basically you see here that I push two different changes on the two different applications and they both get built. But if you only change uh, one application, uh, that's what I'm showing right here, if you're only changing one application, here I'm changing the Drupal application, you see that platform, and that's that's great concept, right? You see that pl pl platform will not rebuild the Angular application because it does a hash of the old tree ID compares them, and if they are the same, that means nothing has changed actually on either your configuration or your code base. So it doesn't need to rebuild anything. It just reuse the same um, package that it already ha or already has. And you get the very lovely message, slug already built for this tree ID. <laughs> Keeping. So basically, it's not going to slow down. It's not going to rebuild all the dependencies if you don't touch the Angular application. If you're working on Drupal, you're still, you still have access always to the Angular application. You can still test your code base, but it's not going to get rebuilt all the time. So that's how we solve that um, multi-application uh, stuff. Why is that? Yeah. Oh, you want to talk about the TV now? <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's, okay. It's, it's, no, I think we're good. That was the, the three problems that we have identified and the three solutions. And uh, we got uh, Doug here who <laughs> said, the TV who asked me away. to put a slide for a TV. <laughs> so, um, after the questions, we're going to get, so we're getting basically to the end of the presentation. We're going to open the floor for questions. But um, at the Commerce Guys platform booth uh, downstairs, um, we're raffling away not that TV, but it is a 4K flat screen TV, and you it's can take it home with TV. you it's if not you picture. or we'll ship it to you if um, if you win. And to participate in this once of a lifetime opportunity, all you have to do is see this guy. Raise your hand, Doug. Um, either now yeah, Doug. or at the booth later, and um, uh, sign up for um, a chance to win that. Um, you'll also, as a result of that, get exciting product notifications like when we add new cool stuff to Platform SH. It's, since we um, have a one-man marketing team, um, then we don't actually send out that many emails, so it will, we won't spam you to death. Maybe um, at some point we might. But be warned, if we yeah. take off like wildfire, then we're going to have the hugest marketing team on Earth. You can unsubscribe later, no matter what. So then we're going to spam you a lot, so yeah. sorry. But that will uh, take time. Um, yeah, question time. If you have questions, <laughs> please walk down the aisle and line up uh, at the microphone. The reason for that is so that the rest of the room can hear you, and this is a recorded session, so um, people watching the video later will hear your question if you uh, ans ask it into the microphone. Um, the first question is always the hardest. Yes. If there are any. And I know Ricardo is going to come up with a zinger. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not too bad. Um, it's about Git submodules. Have you done any work with uh, referencing submodules in your deployments? It's fully supported and yeah. being used in production. Yeah. And actually, I think for the Symfony documentation, uh, you can just check the code. Uh, and uh, we are using submodule to download the sim. Uh, it's a Sphinx extension, and uh, it's in the submodule from another repo. So it just uh, you push, and uh, it's going to get your pull your submodules. Yeah. 
Hi. Uh, so my question is related to live environments and how you actually m move the data fr fr from live to testing and do this continuous flow because live environments have a lot of data, big databases, and then how these things go to development environments and local development environments. Is this possible, for example, at all? And yeah. that, so, I'll take that. So um, as long as you're on the cloud and all of those environments on the cloud, the data synchronization is conceived of going down, so from master to all of the other branches. And it's a one-button process that you can choose to um, bring your merge code changes and or uh, to bring new copies of the data from the parent environment. And it's, rare, it's very fast. Um, it's independent of the size of your data, more or less. There's, like, there's a, a light um, uh, linear curve that means it'll take a little bit longer for more data. But tens and hundreds of gigabytes of data are no problem to be, mer to be synchronized in just uh, two to three or four minutes, um, depending on how much it is. And it's a one-button process. So you, ju you don't need to manage it. And the way we do that is at the file system level, and we do it in such a way that you get all of the data. So when you do that synchronization of data, you get the MySQL database in it, the state that it's in at that moment. You get your uploaded files. You get the solar index. Uh, you get anything else that's persisting, anything to disk, all in one integral state. And this is a really big problem with applications. Otherwise, if you think simply about a Drupal application, if I upload, if I, if I write a blog post and it has an image on it, You've got three places that that data is stored. You've got the database, which is the canonical record of the, the fact that it exists, but you've also got the uploaded file, which is the canonical record of the, the image itself, and then you've got a solar index on that, which is um, ancillary data about that stuff, and if those fall out of sync, then you could have a database that thinks it's got a file that's not on the file system, or you could have a solar index that has a post in it that you've actually deleted. And keeping those in synchronicity is uh, guaranteed when you do the synchronization with us. Now, for the local <laughs> um, development, then you use, for Drupal, you use things like Drush um, SQL Dump or Drush rsync to bring the, um, local, the remote files and database into your local environment. We have plans in the future to extend this data synchronization to local, but that's not something we're going to launch this year even. So it's, it's more of a mid to longer term roadmap item. And I, I want to okay, add you. that you can also, um, and that's what we use for our client side project, you can also sanitize the database while it's getting from the live to the staging and to the development environment, which means uh, sanitizing a database is just for, you have a command, for example, for Drupal with Drush. Uh, it's a Drush SQL sanitize. It's going to trim or remove all the passwords from the users, uh, change all their email address with a specific uh, pattern that you can have. So any like sensitive data that you might have live, you don't want them on your development environment. So you can just uh, sanitize the database while you're actually uh, synchronizing the data so that uh, from the live to the development environment, you're not getting any uh, sensitive data. But you, you work with exactly the same amount of data, the same structure, the same everything, except uh, there's no sensitive data. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, actually, Mary, um, my question was actually related exactly to that. Um, since uh, we have uh, pretty strict um, requirements around the privacy, and we also need to sanitize the content so that it's no, in no way we can actually have access to the actual content uh, the users produced. And so I was wondering, is it possible to hook into the sanitiz sanitization process? So yeah. you have... Um, when you deploy, we expose what are called build hooks and um, deploy hooks. Build hooks are, can be any script, and it can use any dependency from Composer, PIP, Ruby, um, NPM, uh, Bower, uh, any of those. Um, and you can script against that. You can also provide your own scripts. So this puts your code base together in the way that you want. Then the um, deploy hook assumes that the application is in place, but you just haven't started sending traffic to it yet. So that means you can run Drush commands. Um, if it's a Symfony application, you can um, run um, not ascetic. What's the other command that um, would update the schema? 
darn it, I don't remember. In any case, you can do things like update DB um, on other applications as well. And you could do your sanitization script then. And by building that into the code base and the project, it would run for every developer every time they push um, if you want. You can also control if it only does it once, like when it goes from master to whatever the next branch is, um, using something what we call environment variables. That's a variable that you control from the platform UI that we store separately from your application that we inject into environments at runtime so that you can store data like uh, connections to payment gateways, to marketing tools, to email lists, and you can configure at the platform level which endpoints and details are used for which environments. That way you don't have to put those in settings PHP or in your code base because then you'd have a problem merging that between different environments. So you could say use an environmental variable that says on all of your development environments use sanitized data and then that would trigger the sanitization. Thank you. And then another question about the access control you were uh, showing earlier. Actually, um, you were uh, explaining us that uh, you are, we are able to build uh, an additional layer of access control on top of GitHub's one. Uh, on, I was on top of our Git, not um, on top of GitHub. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah uh, that's what I was wondering, actually. Um, so if a um, uh, developer has access to any branch locally to the... Um, so to in, right, in the, the access layer in that case is the ability to merge and push. Okay. Um, is it also visibility for if, you, if you're not even a reader on a Git branch, does that prevent you from um, checking that branch out? Yes. Yes, so yes. It, it's a, it also applies if I'm doing a Git poll or I want to check out a branch, uh, if I'm not permissioned to do that on the platform level, then I cannot get to that branch. You cannot, fetch. You cannot okay. fetch a branch if you don't have access to it. Thank you. Okay, so I really enjoyed the, the graph that you showed on uh, HHVM, and as a contrib author, I'd like to see if my modules run on Drupal 8. So my question is too prone. Uh, first, how was your experience in getting Drupal 8 to run on HHVM? Uh, is it straight? No, no issues at all. No, no issues. It's one line of change uh, on okay. your configuration file. You push, and it's faster, just and, faster. And, uh, I saw like that really. you are offering away free trial. How does that work on Contrib? Because I don't want to like try it for thirty days and then not see it again. Well, um, so you'd want to talk to us later. So the the official commercial offers that there's a thirty day trial. Okay. Um, that's applicable one time. Um, if you want to, if you're a contrib maintainer and you want to set up a project that is specifically for the sake of guaranteeing hip hop VM uh, compatibility or PHP 5.6 compatibility or PHP 5.5, you could set up a project and your different branches would have those different versions on each one and you could um, push your code to each one and it, that's easy too. You would just in Drupal 7, you just use a drush make line. In mm -hmm. Drupal 8, you just use composer. Um, and, and make sure that the module comes in the right way. And if you're doing it on GitHub, it would be automatic. It would push every time you change anything on GitHub, it would test it. So I would offer that to you for free as a module maintainer for that purpose at any time without any question. Just okay. come and talk to me afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Cool. And we are right on time. All right. So thanks, everybody. Um, Thank you very much. See you all this morning. And see you at the booth. Thanks very much. See Doug for the TV.